and welcome to Right Hearted with me, Stuart Wakefield. I'm delighted to have this guest with me this week. Um, he is a novelist, an essayist, a short story writer. He is executive director of National Novel Writing Month. Uh, he is the man. He is the legend, but he is not a myth because I am going to be speaking to him today. It's Grant Faulkner. Thank you so much, Stuart, for that uh, nice introduction. I, I don't think I'm a legend either, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll accept that moniker for now. Well, you know what? I am a uh, municipal liaison for uh, the Hertfordshire um, area uh, in the UK for National Novel Writing Month. So as far as I'm concerned, you are a legend. <laughs> well, thank you, Stuart. I appreciate, I appreciate all you do as a municipal liaison, by the way. I don't know if your listeners know what a municipal liaison does. But you guys are the heroes of NaNoWriMo around the world. So big thanks for uh, helping so many people write their story. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting year. Uh, you know, obviously yeah. with lockdown and COVID and not being able to see people sort of face to face. Um, from your point of view, how do you think it has affected National Novel Writing Month? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm the type of person I like to see opportunity in crisis. And um, as a writer, you know, I'm always looking for the ironies of in life. And I think that there were a lot of ironies in COVID uh, or in this, you know, this last year. And I think, you know, uh, it was interesting how, to me, how people had this really strong desire to connect and to cr connect um, creatively and fortunately, we had the technology that allowed that to happen. And so what I saw happening in NaNoWriMo is a lot of people around the world still writing with each other and making new connections online. And our municipal liaisons like you, Stuart, it was super challenging. I mean, out of the, out of the sky, you know, dropped this, you know, new world where people couldn't organize in-person writing events. And I can't believe how many municipal liaisons took it upon themselves to, you know, learn how to host writing gatherings on Zoom or on Discord or whatever platform. And, you know, that was challenging and it didn't work for some people so well, of course, but for a lot of people, it did work really well. And it allowed people who might not normally come to write-ins to be able to access them and to come. And so I hope it leads to a new world of gatherings where, you know, writers do gather more and more and write together on Zoom or that they're hybrid events that municipal liaisons host. And also, it was interesting to me how many uh, participants just organized their own write-ins with their friends via Zoom. So I, I think in a lot of ways it brought people together and I hope that that continues. I, yeah, I, I have definitely seen these behaviors where, you know, when we're talking about this year, um, you know, we were talking about getting back to face-to-face -to -face meetings and there were some people that said, can we still do something virtual um, once a week? I do think we might have slightly gotten ahead of ourselves, though, because um, there might be some listeners who don't know what National Novel Writing Month is. Ah. Could you fill us in? Gosh, are there people on the planet who don't know what National Novel Writing Month is? I know, it's outrageous. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing in that way because so many people do know about it and so many do, people do participate, yet some people don't know about it, and that's uh, perfectly understandable. Um, National Novel Writing Month, I always, I always have a hard time describing it because it's so many things. Uh, it started out as an accidental uh, writing event where, uh, when Chris Beatty, um, this guy and the, the founder of NaNoWriMo uh, in Berkeley, decided he wanted to write a novel and he invited 20 of his friends to join him. And, you know, he did it just because he wanted to write a novel with his friends. Uh, but it caught on, on the, in the early days of the internet. And those 21 writers have grown to 500,000 writers. Uh, last year, we had about 300,000 people participate in National Novel Writing Month and about 100,000 um, kids and teens in our Young Writers Program. And I always say, but but don't don't get confused. Uh, National Novel Writing Month isn't uh, just an event like we were talking about earlier. It's really a community to me. Mm -hmm. um, so many people um, come to write together. And uh, I forgot to say what the basic challenge is. When Chris Beatty decided he could write it, wanted to write a novel, he decided to write fifty thousand words in thirty days in a month. And so that happens every November. That's when National Novel Writing Month happens. Although we have year-round programming. Um, and so what happens during NaNoWriMo is that you come to our website and you sign up and you have that goal and deadline, which we call a creative midwife, 
Um, it's all about not waiting until someday, until that perfect someday to write your yeah. novel, but to write it today. And, and that you, 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 you don't have to take classes to, write a no- to learn to write a novel. You don't have to have a certificate. You know, you, you are a writer uh, just by writing. And so we, we, yeah. we, we, we try to inspire and empower people to embrace themselves as creators. Uh, one of the most disappointing things uh, that I sometimes hear from people is I'll invite them to do National Novel Writing Month and they'll tell me I'm not a creative type or I'm not a writer. Right. That was my dog growling, by the way, if you heard That's that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it, my dog is like reluctant to buy into the NaNoWriMo program right now. But um, yeah, so so it's, 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 um, it's, it's, I always say it's one part writing boot camp and that writing 50,000 words in 30 days is the boot camp part, but it's one part rollicking party and that gathering with, with other people to write together um, is the rollicking party part. And so everything that Chris Beatty did that first year is still present with us. We still write with other people and we still have these big um, audacious goals that people um, str- you know strive for. And um, it, we still think that the best way to learn to write a novel is by doing it. Mm. Yeah, I, and I've I've noticed a real a real change in people. <clears throat> I've been doing National Novel Writing Month since two thousand and nine, and I have seen people sort of you know start to to you know join in. And the first year they might not get to fifty thousand words, um, but they're encouraged by everyone else in their region and their community. Um, and you know they come back the next year and, and you know give it another go. And I see people flourish. I see people who, um, you know, some people do find you know writing quite a solitary um, existence. And especially for those for those people who don't have anyone in their family, um, you know, who necessarily supports their work. I think it's a really key thing to be able to have you know a group of people that you are you are around. And I have seen very powerful things happen. Um, when writers get together, um, what what actually attracted you to taking over um, from Chris and becoming kind of you know being at the forefront of National Novel Writing Month? Yeah, you know, I um, actually came to NaNoWriMo as a writer initially. Okay, I think it was two thousand eight or two thousand nine. I did it the first time, and I I did it because I was this um, somewhat ponderous writer. I took a, a fair amount of time to write a first draft. I tended to really try to perfect things. So I moved slowly. And I, I got to this point in my life where I was just like, I asked myself, did I decide on my creative process? Did I define it? Mm-hmm. Or did it just kind of happen to me? And I, I realized it just kind of happened to me. So I thought I should experiment. And okay. so I, I so I tried NaNoWriMo because Chris was an acquaintance of mine. I actually my good friend Jake participated, I think, in the year 2000 before it really took off. Um, and I actually thought when I first heard about it, I thought it was the most ridiculous idea ever. <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> um, I was like, how, how, how preposterous to write <laughs> 50,000 words in a month. And, you know, right. I, I, I'd gone to writing school and everything. And I, 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 I just didn't, I don't know, I didn't get it. And I didn't give it a chance, really. I didn't really think about it. Uh, but my friend Jake was having a great time doing it. And it was really satisfying to him. Uh, but anyway, so around 2008 or nine, I tried my hand at it and um, I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed the way that it shook up my own creative writing process and, uh, you know, a number of benefits. But one thing, um, you know, I was writing and I would write the first chapter of a novel just over and over and over and try to get it yeah. perfect before I yeah. could move on. And what I didn't really know and, and really, you know, is that when you're writing a novel, once you're done with it and start revising it, usually that first chapter gets dramatically changed or cut. Yes. <laughs> so so <laughs> you shouldn't, you shouldn't waste a lot of time writing it in that first draft, you know, uh, and the main thing is to like really explore the totality of your story and to really get all of it out and to not really worry too much about how perfect it is uh, because you're going to have plenty of chance to revise it later and I always quote this Joyce Carol Oates line. She says, you don't know the first sentence of your novel until you've written your last sentence. And that's, mm-hmm. that's really true. It's like this yeah. really circular process. And so I think what she meant, meant by that was that, you know, you, you have to explore that whole story and take a lot of risks and um, experiment. And then when you get to that last sentence, you kind of know what the story is or you, you're so you're much better informed and you can go back to that first sentence in that first chapter and then come to it with a 
with a much better perspective. And so I just liked it in terms of how it helped me get through a rough draft because I hate rough drafts, actually. Okay. I, 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 talk, I talk to a lot of NaNoWriMo writers and they love the rough draft and they hate revising, but I'm, I'm the opposite. I hate the rough okay. draft and I, I love the revising. Um, I mean, I like portions of the rough draft, of course. I like exploring yes. my story and I like all those imaginative possibilities, but I find it very tough to get through it. Um, and then, um, yeah, and so I, th- I, I think like, like a, NaNoWriMo is about experimentation and it's about taking risks and it's about making yourself vulnerable and it's about going down, you know, dark and sometimes forbidding pathways of your novel. Mm-hmm. And so I liked all of that. And so once I did it, um, I reached out to Chris Beatty, who again was an acquaintance and we had lunch and talked and got to know him better. And I was working for a nonprofit here in Berkeley, the National Writing Project, uh, which focused on helping teachers teach writing better, and just mentioned to Chris that I'd, I'd uh, see if he knew of any uh, nonprofit board positions in the Bay Area uh, because I was l- looking to kind of deepen my nonprofit management experience. And okay. lo-, lo lo and behold, he uh, ended up encouraging me to join his board, um, <laughs> the Nanorama board. I did not expect that. I was deeply honored. And then uh, when I joined the board. Um, he told me that he was stepping down and he encouraged me to apply for his job. Again, I had not counted on that. I was deeply honored. He convinced me to apply and then I got the job. So that was in 2012 when I started. Okay. And how has that changed your attitude to writing or to other people's writing, if at all? Good question. You know, I have grown so much as a writer uh, by being involved with NaNoWriMo and you know, when I mentioned earlier my friend Jake doing it in 2000, I think what I didn't get about NaNoWriMo uh, way back then was par- part of the beauty of it is it's not about people writing for publication. It's about people r- writing for creativity's sake, mm-hmm. you know, in- enjoying art for art's sake. And I think that that's something that's too often, too many adults, um, they leave the creative parts of themselves behind. And they do this almost without knowing it because the demands of our to-do lists are so, become so, you know, formidable and so smothering. And so NaNoWriMo to me, I mean, a lot of people do participate and they become great writers and they get published, all that. We've had many best-selling authors, but a lot of people just like to get together with friends and be creative and explore their imaginations and be playful and find joy in creativity. And that's like the side of NaNoWriMo that I really actually love the most because I think very few other writing organizations truly honor and nurture that side of creativity. Mm -hmm. And so, and so NaNoWriMo I think has this uh, wonderful spectrum of writers and this wonderful sort of whimsicality to it. And uh, by being so playful, it's actually not so serious, not so competitive, not so hierarchical. And so people, I think like they, I mean, I love how NaNoWriMo writers, um, you know, like we'll do a word sprint and we'll write for five or 10 minutes. And for those people who don't know what a word sprint is, you, you get a prompt and you write as much as you can. And it's amazing because I've never seen anyone not be able to put words on the page. So this is my argument against writer's block. Um, but of course you write a lot of funny, goofy, you know, weird sentences. And what I love about the NaNoWriMo community is that they're eager to share those sentences. So they'll post them online or they'll read them. And so it's a way to kind of poke fun at yourself as a writer, you know, mm-hmm. which I think is like creatively liberating unto itself. It's a way to not take yourself so seriously. Yes. I think, I think so many writing organizations like that, that kind of like taking yourself super seriously um, and being in competition with others for who is writing the best or getting mm-hmm. the most awards or getting published, whatever. I, I think it takes like that, just the essential joy out of, of writing. And I think that's what NaNoWriMo If we're doing, I mean, we're doing a lot of good in different ways in the world, but one of the key parts of the good we're doing is, is joy, you know, just like spreading the joy of creativity and helping people tap into that, into the, in themselves, um, and, and live it out, especially as adults. Yeah. And I I think there's something in there that speaks to, you know, why, why people are writing. One of my participants, he writes a hundred thousand words, um, both in National Novel Writing Month, which is in November, but then the sisters sort of uh, camp NaNoWriMo, which is when you get to set your own uh, writing target. So those run in April and July, and he will regularly write 100,000 words for every event, and he will go back and he will revisit and revise, and he will never, 
ever let anybody else read what he's written. And I and I find that really interesting because I, I've been very lucky. I've sold about 15,000 books um, from my NaNoWriMo books that I've gone on to revise. Um, so the thought of him not wanting anyone to see anything and he writes for himself it took me quite a while to kind of get my get my head around that but as you say you know NaNoWriMo is what it needs to be for whoever it is who's writing so for you I'm interested do you still do the challenge yourself every year yeah definitely I um I feel um I always say it's the best job perk or job requirement I've ever had. Yeah. It's, it's actually not a job requirement, but I, I feel like it is. And part of the reason I feel like it is is because one of the most, um, one of the excuses I hear most often from writers is that they don't have the time to write. They're too busy. Yeah. And I, I, I know there are many, many busy people in the world. Um, and so I, I honor that, but at the same time, I think being busy is per, a perception. I mean, yes. I've talked to people who say they're too busy to write and they're people who they don't have a job. <laughs> they might have a trust, <laughs> they might have a trust fund. They don't have a family. You know what I mean? They've, yeah. they've obviously got more time available than they think they do. And I've also, you know, of, of course I've seen people also say they're too busy and they, you know, maybe they've got two jobs and a family. And so I, I know that some people are too busy, but at the same time, it's interesting to me how busyness is a perception. And so people always sometimes think that I'm too busy to do it, but I'm like, no, I can't hold myself to a different standard than anyone else. Mm. And that is part of the beauty of the challenge is that, you know, we're all too busy. And so how do we make creativity a priority? And NaNoWriMo is this invitation once a year to put creativity number one on your to-do list for just one month. Mm -hmm. And just to experience that. And it's, it's super powerful to do it for one month. And if you do it for one month, um, a lot of people keep going on beyond that, or they find ways they might not write 50,000 words a month, but they find other ways to, to keep that creativity in their lives. And, and I, I know of hundreds of stories that are so inspirational on this level, but I always tell the story of Toni Morrison, who was a single mom. Uh, she had a couple kids, I believe she lived in New York city. And after she, fed them dinner, helped them with their homework, got them to bed. She had about 15 minutes to herself. That was all she had the entire day. Mm -hmm. And she used that 15 minutes to write her first novel. And so I use that as an example is if you are too busy to, to look for those tiny little nooks and crannies in your day, those tiny yeah. little chunks to yeah. be creative because all those small little increments of words add up to something big. And NaNoWriMo, the interesting thing about NaNoWriMo is that we're maybe the only writing organization in the world who relies on simple math to do big things, <laughs> you know? And so like, just apply some simple math here. Yeah. In, in 15 minutes, you're probably able to write about 200 words and writing 200 words a day for a month is, a, what is that? 6,000 words. Mm -hmm. If you do that every month, that's 72,000 words in a year. And that's a novel. Yeah. And so you can do it in 15 minutes a day. So I, there's a notion, one of the words for this use of time is to use time confetti in your life. And I like that because it celebrates all of those little moments of time. And instead of just like using them to like scroll through stuff on your phone, um, use them to be creative. Yeah. Time confetti. I love that. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't come up with that, but somebody else did. And it's a lovely word. I remember um, I used to commute into London. I used to work for what is now Warner Media. And um, I remember sitting on the train coming back and um, I, I was on my phone and there was an, an older lady sitting next to me and she turned around and she said, that's the longest text message I've ever seen. <laughs> and before I had a chance to um, respond, she gave me this big, long lecture about looking out of the window and taking the world in and all of this kind of stuff. Anyway, she finished and I said, oh, I said, actually, I'm writing a novel. I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm ah. doing this um, in an app. And I wrote 300 words and, and I'm not a fast texter. I mean, I, I text with like one thumb and uh, I managed to do three, 300 words. And, and it, there is something in there. I mean, I've had a few run-ins with people who've said, you know, I don't have time to write. And I'm like, well, do you watch TV? Do you look at Twitter? Do you look at social media? They're like, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. 
And I'm like, well, sometimes it's about making the time. And I, yeah. I think for some people, when they do the, the challenge in, in November, um, they kind of give them the self, they give themselves permission to make the time. Yep. And, you know, I've seen people right before work, right at lunchtime, you know, as you say, grab those 15 minutes here and there. And I've also had meetings, um, you know, sessions with writers and we'll do a sprint for 15 minutes. And they, at the end of the sprint, they say, I wrote more in that 15 minutes than I've written all week. Exactly. It's all, it, it's fascinating to me. Mm. Um, just like you said, time is a decision, you know, and I think it's important to, to remember that, especially like with things like social media, because I think we've, we're letting other powers sort of make that decision for us yeah, so often. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the writing sprints are really powerful, really powerful to show you how much you can get done in 15 minutes and really powerful to me uh, for all those people who say they have writer's block and can't write. Because like I said, I always tell people I don't believe in writer's block and the reason yeah. I don't because I have scientific evidence. I've, I've, I've been involved in hundreds, maybe thousands of word sprints. And like I said, I've never seen one person not be able to write. So that's pretty yeah. powerful. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, a form of procrastination. Yeah, procrastination and fear. Mm. And I, I also understand that when you've experienced trauma or when you're depressed, like you can't write. Um, so I'm not talking about those situations with writer's block. Um, I'm talking more about when, you know, when we're living our day-to-day lives, um, that you can write if there are ways to get words on the page. And what I think is interesting about the word sprints too, you know, one aspect of NaNoWriMo is it's kind of like improv acting. Like the basic principle of improv acting is that you say yes and to your thoughts. You don't don't question them. You don't deliberate. And you say yes and to whatever happens on the stage. You just go with it. And that's a key part of NaNoWriMo, I think, and one of the, the key parts of its, you know, um, creative experimentation, you know, component. Um, but with word sprints, you're really, you've got, you, you say yes and, you've got to keep that pen moving, you know, you've got to keep the words flowing. And, and, and the, the fact is, is we've got all these stories, we've got gushers of stories in our head, you know, mm-hmm. that we're not even conscious of, they just want to come out. Yeah. And words, word sprints just kind of open up that, that, I don't know that spigot and let, let, let the, all, all the imagination flow. So they're really magical. I have a lot of people say to me, you know, well, well, you know, if I'm at a party and they say, you know, what do you do? And I say, oh, you know, I'm a writer and I'm a book coach. And you know, you have the conversation, Oh, you know, I'd love, I'd love to write a book or I've got an idea about a book. Um, but and then they say, well, you know, I'm not creative. Uh, mm-hmm. And I always say, well, you know, show me your Instagram posts because chances are you're lying about what your life is really like. And I think that's, <laughs> that, that's, 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 we're all that, storytellers. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then uh, I always, I always think it's a, a problem solving thing. So I, I, you know, I've said to people, okay, if you have a story to tell, your problem is how are you going to tell it? It's figuring that out. And whether that's a novel or poetry or, a, you know, a memoir um, or microfiction. I'll talk to you about yours soon. But, um, yeah, I mean, and I think once you work out what that problem is and how you can fix it and get the the story out there, um, I think you're kind of, that's half the battle won. And for me, that's what National Novel Writing Month did for me. It It helped me figure out, okay, how am I going to do this thing? And, and as you say, it was grabbing the time confetti as it, as it falls out of the sky and, you know, making that commitment. And I think if you can make that commitment, as you say, for one month, and it can be exhausting. First of December, the last thing I want to look at is a blank page. But after, after a couple of days recovery, you know, what I found, and I've seen it in other writers, that, that they realise it's pro- probably not quite quite that difficult. Um, so thinking about your your writing pre um, NaNoWriMo, what what how did you kind of structure your day? Because your day now is very structured. How did you do it before? <laughs> oh boy, hard hard to remember. I've gone so, through so many phases of, of being a writer. Now, okay. now, like you say, I am very structured, and that's because of my sleep patterns. I, mm. I naturally wake up very early most mornings. I never set an alarm, but I'm usually up by four or five. 
which is a gift because I get a couple of hours of really peaceful, quiet time yeah. when my family isn't up um, to write. And so that's, that's the time I get my writing done. And, and maybe because I'm a morning person, but I'm absolutely not an evening person. So I have a <laughs> really, it is painful and torturous for me to write in the evenings. So um, yeah, I'm strictly a morning writer. And that's been wonderful. I mean, I, I've been a morning writer pretty much my entire life. Uh, when I okay. first decided to become a writer in my 20s, I very purposefully got jobs, waiting tables or working in bookstores. And I always took the night shift. And that was so that I could have the bulk of the daytime for myself creatively. And that was my favorite way to live. Actually, it was wonderful because I could write and read during the days. And then I would go into this very active, um, engaging space, like waiting tables in a restaurant and be very social and get a lot of stories and a lot of stimulation. And then, you know, wake up the next morning and be very um, solitary. So uh, I love that rhythm. I would go back to it in a second if I could. Um, but yeah, right now it's, it's very much about being a morning writer. Um, and, and, but, but I also like, you know, for me, like one thing that's been weird about my writing life is that I have so many different writing demands coming at me, so many mm -hmm. different either types of writing to do. Like like right now, for instance, I'm, I'm finishing up book promotion for um, my collection of short stories that's coming out next month in July, all the comfort sin can provide. And part of that promotion is writing a variety of articles for different uh, journals, you know? So I'm working on articles and essays to promote that. But then I just signed a book contract for this uh, book on uh, flash fiction, The Art of Brevity. And even though I've written most of that book, it's due, I still have work to do on it. And that's due on September 1st. So I'm juggling, you know, all these different uh, mm -hmm. writing projects at the same time. And, uh, and there are a lot of like kind of mini writing projects within that. And that's what I find my writing life increasingly is I don't have like a long sustained time to focus on a writing project. So I'm always juggling different things. But I think that that generally, I, I've made it work for me. I think it's my attention span has sort of gotten <laughs> very splintered and fragmented. So I, I, I love hopping from one project to the other. Right. Uh, I find that when I hop to another project, I get like renewed fuel and renewed interest. Mm -hmm. and, and that stimulates me. And then I can hop back to maybe the novel or the nonfiction book I was working on. So I really just kind of continually am juggling these writing projects depending on what the deadline is. And it's, it's a rare moment when I don't have anything without a deadline. Although that's a beautiful moment because I think every writer needs to have moments where you're just strictly either nourishing your, your create, your inspiration mm -hmm. or, or just, you know, being playful and trying out new things. And I, I love it when I have a week or two where I can just, you know, try out some new stories or, you know, just explore things uh, very randomly. The, the, what what are your observations around sort of like you know positive stress because i've spoken to you know quite a few professional writers um during lockdown and they've kind of lost their mojo because they have all the time in the world to write now and uh they have found that it's kind of sort of trailed off where whereas before certainly the ones who had day jobs because they had this they knew they had to fit the writing in they 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 got it in um so what are your thoughts around and you might want to put this in context of you know national novel writing month but um you know what what's it like for you when you sort of have free time or downtime i mean do you do you miss writing or do you like having that break well to, uh, to address the first part of the question i believe that constraints are really good for creativity Mm -hmm. And I think the lack of constraints can be bad. And so sometimes I think when people have too much time, that's what I was mentioning earlier in, in, mm -hmm. in the show, is that sometimes too much time is bad for your writing. Yeah. Um, it, it's good to have pressure on yourself. And, and NaNoWriMo itself is a constraint, right? It's like write 50,000 words in 30 days, not 60 days, 30 mm -hmm. days. So, And so I think like most of us live lives with constraints. And those constraints can be good for your writing, just like I mentioned with Toni Morrison or Ray Bradbury. Uh, he had children and he wrote his early 
novels on a typewriter at UCLA and he, on his lunch breaks. And he had to like put in a quarter to like rent the typewriter for wow. a, half, a half an hour. So, you know, that <laughs> that's a constraint. You have a half an hour during your lunch break and you write as much as you can, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and I find that, that my writing generally has some form of constraint around everything I do. Uh, whether it's a deadline um, or self-imposed or otherwise. And, and those moments of having nothing to do, I mean, they're too rare for me. I need more of them. And I, I again, I think they're really good because they're creatively nourishing. And mm. for me to, for me to go sit on a beach or someplace for a week or two or three and to be able to, to read and just let my imagination go. I mean, I usually only do this when I travel I love, I, I mean, this is something that didn't happen in the pandemic because most of us didn't travel, but just to be on a plane, that's when I like read novels and really I'm not working on projects. I don't have a deadline and, and I love letting, you know, we all need to do this, right? We all just need mm. to tap into that, that deeper form of creativity and playfulness. And that's where we discover our next stories, or that's where we can kind of enliven uh, the writing projects that we're working on, you know, at the time. So somehow I think in an ideal life, it would be balancing those two aspects, you know, of sort of intense writing within constraints, but also, um, you know, time to fritter and to play. Yes. Yes, absolutely. How, how do you, how important do you think it is to have somebody cheering you on? I, you know, I, I think I spent a lot of my lifetime not truly uh, acknowledging how important that was. I was a very, very solitary writer. And one of the things I've learned uh, about being involved with NaNoWriMo is just the power of community mm. and the power of encouragement and just the power of, fe of feeling loved and accepted, yeah. you know, because yeah. it is doing, I mean, writing is, we're making ourselves so deeply vulnerable on so many different levels, whether it's the story we're writing or if we're trying to get published, all the rejection we're going to face. And even when you're published, you still face possible rejection. Yes. Bad reviews, negative mm -hmm. comments from re readers on Twitter, you know, whatever. There's there's a hundred different, thousands of different kinds of perfect, uh, rejection. And and that is just a day-to-day -day thing in being a writer. You know, it's just something we live with. It's, it's part of the breath, the air we breathe. And so um, having encouragement, having... Um, a writing community and writing friends, people you know you can lean on, people who believe in you. It's just uh, so, so, so powerful. So I, um, I, every day I'm more and more thankful for the people who, and, and I try to recognize them, the people who've actually helped me, you know, and I think so many mm -hmm. writers, we, like they do, they, 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 you'll, you'll read interviews with them when they become successful. And I think it's, it's, it's easy to focus on all those anguishing moments of, and solitary moment, moments when you were you were working and laboring over your novel, and, and easy not to recognize or to forget you know, all all of that sort of assistance that people provided, um, that might not have been direct assistance, but people just encouraging you. And I just wrote the acknowledgments in my collection of short stories, and the last line is is just a thanks to my parents because it's a you know like like they never questioned that I decided to be a writer, you know they were happy for that and they supported that in, in, in any way that they could. And I, I keep going back in time and being like, well, what, what a, I mean, I, I basically chose a highly precarious existence, you know, and, and an easy one. I mean, I, like I had to ask myself, do I, would I support my own kids, you know, yeah, <laughs> in, in yeah. their own artistic endeavors? Because it is like, essentially there's no, there's no true financial payout to, to most people. And, and so, you know, but I'm deeply thankful because if I had had resistance to my parents or any sort of naysaying, I mean, it just would have made it all so much more difficult. And I know that so many people out there do have that naysaying in their lives, whether it's from mm. parents or brothers and sisters or, or, or wives and husbands, you know, or friends, you know, it's just, it's, it's it just, it just can really be tough if you have that um, negativity. So, yes. yeah. So I believe deeply, deeply in, in writing, having a big writing community and writing friends and, and finding whatever encouragement and love you need. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, I'll never forget. My mother said to me once this about 2010, I started a writing group um, that came out of NaNoWriMo and she used to refer to it as your little writing group. Mm. And it was such, 
it, it was just the way she said it. And it really yeah. kind of, kind of stuck with me. And, you know, for me being with those other writers was, was kind of that, that refuge. Um, is that why you married a writer? <laughs> Maybe it is. I wasn't conscious of that. And I have <laughs> no idea what my life would be like if I hadn't married a writer because yeah, we, one of the great benefits of being with Heather is that we, we do, we do deeply understand what the other mm. is going through yeah. and, and we're also deeply supportive of each other creatively and we've structured our lives along those lines. Uh, so I don't know, it would, it would really suck if I had a partner who was questioning yes. um, my writing and, and, you know, I, I it's, it's, you, you open yourself up to that question because I've spent thousands and thousands of hours writing and it's not like that thousands of hours have i don't know tangibly benefited our family you know <laughs> like it's not like there's a lot of money to show for it um, right. i mean i like to think there are a lot of benefits um and they are tangible too i mean just mm -hmm. in, in in the way we approach life you know and if you live a creative life i like to think that there are a lot of benefits that sometimes you don't even notice like the way that you notice the world, the way you interact with people, you know, like, uh, I mean, for me, it's, 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 I mean, I always say humans are meaning, we, we, we make meaning of the world through the stories we tell, you yes. know? And yeah. so for me, that's, that's it in a nutshell is that, you know, I have opened myself up to stories and to noticing things and to thinking about stories. And so I think that makes life richer. And I think that that's very, you know, goes beyond whatever, financial benefits I can get with another job. Yeah. And I, I think there's, you were talking about, you know, the way we consume stories and learn things, I guess, as writers, we are teaching other people things, whether it be in a memoir or setting up a story for them. Um, what do you think are the kind of lessons, I guess, over time, as you look back at your own writing, do you see a kind of a theme in what you're trying to get across in your own work? Hmm. I, maybe I, I, I became a little bit, con I haven't done many interviews for my new book, but I just did one podcast recently and it's, it was interesting to me for what the interviewer noticed in the stories that I hadn't really thought about. And it made okay. me think that I really need to like think about this very question, uh, because I know that there are patterns and themes in my writing. Um, I just haven't, uh, decided to be so conscious of them you know right. like i yeah. i like just getting attracted by a story or an idea for a story and just pursuing it and letting it go where it goes you know and so mm. i think i think i mean i so i don't like to overthink it and and maybe that's good because if i start to overthink it then i've got the answers and i like yes. to ha i like to have the stories be about the mystery of the answers and to write towards that mystery i guess um, so I, I do think that most writers, I mean, um, become repetitive in the themes that they're tracing. And that's because, you know, they're kind of obsessed with certain themes and they lend themselves to repetition and repetition. I'm using that word, not as a negative word, um, but a way to, uh, you know, explore different perspectives and actually deepen, um, that exploration. So, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from exactly answering that. I mean, okay. one, 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 one way I think, um, I, when I think of my stories though, they are, um, oftentimes about, you know, I mean, the, the title of my collection is all the comfort sin can provide. Mm -hmm. And the, and that title was, um, identified by my friend and writer, Pamela Painter. She was reading a story of mine called morphine drip. And that phrase was in that story. And she said, you should title a collection of, or you should title, title a book that. And I thought, yeah, that, that is a great title for these mm. short stories. It really brings them together thematically. And I guess um, as a theme, the reason I'm interested in that is I, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest in Iowa. And I, the way that a lot of small towns work, especially in the Midwest, is there's this veneer of conventional good behavior of nice people. But behind that, those scenes, there's a mm. lot of bad behavior happening. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so I, I love this Emerson quote, too, where he said, you know, what we call sin in others, we call, you know, experiments in ourselves. Mm. And so this, this line between an experiment with yourself versus like what you or others might consider sin, you know, that tension and that, that contradiction within people. 
and how people have to decide about the level of good behavior or bad behavior they do. So that's something I really like to 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 write about, and is obviously very dramatic. And I, not that all my stories are set in small towns, but I think small towns. Um, it's interesting, like since I grew up in a small town, how you know a little bit about everybody's business, you know, and maybe mm, and, may, and oh, maybe yes. a lot, you know. Yeah. So pe- and people. And so you see the, the small town, I guess you're, you're sensitive to the whole theater of people in a way that you're not sensitive to it in a bigger city, just because like, I mean, my town was 10,000 people and there literally was a town square. And so you, you saw people performing their lives in some degree with yeah. a degree of intimacy too, because you knew them and you saw them a lot. So um, I think that that kind of experience when I was young set up um, my imaginative you know, um, storytelling, um, mode as an adult. So I think I operate kind of, I heard that the, the creator of Mad Men said that he, he created that, uh, kind of as if he was looking through the keyhole into his parents' parties. And, oh, and I'm, not, okay. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not doing that with my parents, but I like that analogy for a writer that you're kind of looking through the keyhole at, at other people's uh, behavior or their bad behavior and, and then imagining the whole story. Mm. So let's talk about all the comfort sin can provide. So it sounds like you've you it started with a title. So it, assuming that that's correct, how do you go about writing then a collection of stories into that into that title? How did you how did you approach that? It was actually the opposite. So the oh, title okay. the ti- the title came at the end. Right. And and when Pamela saw that phrase and mentioned it to me, I, I saw that as a unifying theme to the oh, stories okay. that were mo- mostly already written at that time. Not all of them, but so right. this this collection takes stories. I mean, one of the interesting things for me to reckon with is that they're not stories all that have all been written in the last few years. Like okay. uh, one of the stories was written nearly 30 years ago. Um, and so they, the stories span, you know, basically most of my adult writing life in some degree. So they've been written, you know, some, I mean, some of them have been written, you know, within the last year and some of them have been written a long time ago. So there are, in some ways, it's a collection of stories that have been written by different versions of Grant Faulkner. <laughs> so, so I, I, I sometimes feel like that I need a little stamp to put on different stories. Like here's the, here's the 1997 version of myself, you know, <laughs> well, how do you, how do you feel when you look back at 1997 Grant in his writing? Yeah. I mean, that's, what's interesting about this is they're, you know, sometimes they're not stories that I would write now, but they're stories that I feel are, are hold up. I think they're good. I think they're mm-hmm. valuable. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable putting them into the world. And like I said, it's more like a version of me than a different me. So I, I think of like the writers in this collection of being sort of like brothers and sisters of me. Um, maybe there's one first cousin in there, but that's about as distant <laughs> as it gets. Um, so I, and I, you know, I think that applies to most uh, authors to some degree. I mean, all of, you know, as you get older, your, your writing from the past is about a, being a different self in a different world. Mm. And so I don't think you can disown that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't disown any of these stories just like I wouldn't disown a novel that I might've written in 1992. What, what, what kind of frame of mind do you have to be in not to to kind of tinker with a 30 year old story? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I think I've read so many writers say this, that, you know, a writer is never truly done (laughs) with a story or a novel. And, um, I mean, I think all of these stories are like anything I've written. You get to the point where you're like, I've done all that I can do for this, you know, and it's, it's finished. But that, but that said, I actually just read a proof copy of this. So I've mainly reading, I can only um, correct things that, um, you know, are, are blatant typos. Okay. Um, but, but I had a hard time because as I read through all these stories, there were definitely mm-hmm. things where I was like, Ooh, I want to cut that phrase or you know what I mean? Like, yeah, or I yeah. want to change, change the rhythm of the sense. I mean, it was generally small stuff, uh, but it was interesting to me how I still wanted to work on these, <laughs> you know, give, <laughs> yeah. give them, give them one last shot, but then, you know, <laughs> I, I could give them one last shot and they could go back into a proof copy and it could be delivered to me and I'd certainly see something else. So yeah. at yeah. some point you've just got to call it quits and put it out into the world. 
and and it was like you were saying like you can endlessly tinker with the first chapter of a book yeah you know but it but at the end you know it's it's a case of like diminishing returns i'm talking of thinking about kind of economy of of words and phrases and making everything count um let, let's talk a little bit about your 100 word fiction how did how did that come to you yeah that came very randomly i was working on this big big god-awful novel um i'd been working on it for years nearly 10 years i think uh, not like i was working on it that whole 10 years but i started it and been working on it pretty diligently and um uh, a friend of mine published a collection of 100 100 word stories as a memoir and he posted on a Facebook and I really just randomly clicked late at night one night to read some of them. And I was very taken by them. And I started writing them with a friend at work and I just did it sort of playfully and as a break from the novel. Um, and the reason I like, I liked them because like in his memoir, at least they were like these little snapshots, little photographs of his life. Mm. And there were all, there were all these little stories that might not make it into a bigger memoir, but they were all, all very meaningful and very telling. And so I just thought I liked the form on that level and I used it to write fiction. I wasn't writing memoir, but you know, initially I could only get my stories down to like 150 words. Um, and I told him uh, kind of proudly, I was like, Hey, I, you know, I, I got these down very close to hundred words, pretty short. And he was like, Nope, you got to go further. You got to get them to exactly 100 words. And he said, and he said, I guarantee you the stories will be better, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll be more interesting to you. And again, this gets back to writing within constraints, the benefits of creative constraints. And so yeah. I kept working hard to get them down to hundred words and it's very tough to do. It is. Uh, I tried. <laughs> yeah, it's super hard to do, and it's it's. Uh, I've I've had many very accomplished writers not be able to do it. Um, so anyway, like, but and he was right. Once I got down to a hundred words, they were generally better. And it's not the magic of a hundred words exactly. It's more the magic of the constraint. Mm. And like a hundred words, it forces you to really look at each word, each sentence, to see how much work it's doing. It makes you really think about like like just just you know the images you're using. Uh, what's not included in the story. This is like one of my favorite lessons of 100 word stories is that we write as much by what we leave out as by what we include. And this goes for novels too, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that's yeah. how we create suspense. We have to figure out how much can we leave out and, and just give the reader enough to have enough information to orient him or herself and also to, you know, kind of like, you know, pick up that anticipation and that excitement that escalates a story. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about how to write long by going short. And I, I found the hundred word story just an addictive form. So I, <laughs> I just uh, wrote uh, as many of them as I could. And I started this journal, 100wordstory.org, uh, which I still run. That was 10 years ago, uh, almost to the day. And then I published a book, a book Fissures, a collection of my hundred word stories. So yeah, I still love the short form. And I think I mentioned earlier in this podcast, I'm writing a book called The Art of Brevity mm -hmm. that, that will be coming out with the University of New Mexico Press in fall of 2022. So what's, what's that book about? Is that like a how-to? or? A... Yeah, less a how-to. I think of it more as like a... Um, a meditation, you know, okay. uh, a reflection, a series of essays on, um, it, it is partly a how to, but, but, you know, like I, like there's a chapter on constraints. There's a chapter on gaps. Uh, there's a chapter on the sentence. Um, there's a chapter on fragments. So I take all these different aspects of brevity, um, and, and write about them through, um, you know, my own reflections, but also through, you know, examples from other writers as well. It is a, I'm, I'm was shocked how, what a completely different discipline it is. So a few mm -hmm. podcasts ago, I was interviewing uh, Gwen Tolios. She is um, also a municipal liaison for NaNoWriMo, mm. um, but her writing group um, put out short story anthologies. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'm going to have a go at this. I'm about kind of 4,000 words. And it's really hit me just how difficult it, it can be. And it's, I've kind of got to the point where I'm thinking, oh, you know, maybe this could be a novella because it's yeah. too difficult for me to write as a short story. But I did have a crack at the 100 word and I submitted it to your website and got rejected. But, uh -oh. but, 
<laughs> I'm not. It wasn't not, me. It was my. It was my co-editor. No, 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 no that's fine. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not bitter, but um, but yeah, I mean, there is a real art to it, and I thought it was interesting what you said about writing short has helped you write long. So that's definitely a a book I'm going to buy, and b <laughs> something I want to to you know uh, get, just get my head around because I guess I'm. I'm quite wordy, if you see what I mean. I'm quite, you know, generous and stuff. And and when it comes to words, I'm not. I don't really cut everything out, and I don't really sit and think. You know how every kind of episode, um, you know, every sentence works because I'm writing contemporary romance. And and but I'm very conscious about my characters sort of talk on the nose. And what you were saying about it's about as much about what you leave out as it is what you put in i think there's something in there around around dialogue as well because um yeah i think people are not evasive but they often don't say what they really mean exactly i mean that's one of the reasons i like it is because it Mm -hmm. um the form speaks to that chasm of 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 what goes unsaid and what goes unsaid is just as important as what is said and it's interesting when you mentioned contemporary romance i wrote an article this was actually for writers digest february valentine's issue about um the art of seduction in writing and there's this quote from roland barth that oh gosh i'm gonna forget it but it's like something about the excitement is about where the garment gapes you know so the mm-hmm. garment gapes is like a a, a hint and and that's what you're really writing it with in, in when you're writing in short forms you're writing with hints like little little spaces for the garment gapes you know little spaces that are titillating in their way uh, or create suspense and so i think actually the form writing hundred word stories uh can speak to like a romance writer in that way you know like writing romance is part of it at least mm. is like creating that sense of anticipation right yeah and and, and doing it through hints and flirt like like the, there's i think the art of flirtation um as it is in life can apply to writing too, because writing is a type of flirtation, no matter your form. And, and that type of flirtation creates suspense and draws people in. Um, so it's, it is like a part of the art of seduction. And I think the short form is really good about teaching that. And it's also, um, as you mentioned, I think it's, it's, I would say it's it's as much or more about editing than writing. You're really mm. you're you're really like to get especially with a hundred word story. It's kind of like a rubric Rubik's cube. You're kind of constantly twisting it around to get all of the the cubes to match up in the right colors. And that's what you're doing with a hundred word story. You might have ninety three words, and then you add some words, and you've got one hundred and five words, and you have to subtract some words. But in that process of going back and forth forth and trying to find one hundred words, you're 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 really paying attention to all of the language, all of the elements of the story, and, and it's a really heightened attention that you would would probably normally never do with a longer story. Yeah, I I, I remember Andrew Stanton talking about um, from Pixar, saying, "Give them two plus two, don't give them four. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good one. And and I was also thinking about you know about where the garment gapes is that that you know when Victorian women, when their ankles showed yeah, you know, what, what, what kind of, you know, um, desire that would, that would bring out in a man. Um, so thinking about, um, the garment, the gapes, what, what glimpses can you give us, um, for the future of NaNoWriMo? Yeah, gosh. Um, you know, I think NaNoWriMo, we continue, I mean, the challenge for us is that we're a very small nonprofit with a small staff and a small budget. And we're serving a world of writers. And so we're always uh, strained to do that. Uh, very fortunately, we have um, nearly a thousand volunteers like you, Stuart, around the world who host these writing gatherings. So it's magical to me that this small little organization can have such reach, you know, mm-hmm. and such, mm-hmm. um, such uh, you know, in-person direct touch points, you know, that's just amazing to me. So we run, we we do, we run on the power and the goodwill of of our volunteers and our supporters in a number of respects. I mean, there there are also about ten thousand teachers who who teach novel writing in K through twelve schools, and there 
about a thousand libraries who host NaNoWriMo writing events. So it's mm -hmm. all about this, this capacity of others to sort of pass on the magic of creativity. And so at NaNoWriMo, we continually keep working to expand our programs and to be able to invite people in and to ignite their, their creativity in different ways throughout the year. And so whether that's uh, working with our website to, to add functionality to it and to bring to, and also to functionality for writing and for tracking your goals, kind of like Fitbit for writers, as I like to say, but also so to support those community interactions that are so important. And so we'll always be looking for ways to, um, you know, um, nourish our community and uh, keep it in, uh, igniting their their creativity and inspiring them uh, to mm -hmm. write on a lot of different levels. So, for instance, this year during our Camp NaNoWriMo, which you mentioned, which is happening in July, and it's a more casual version of NaNoWriMo, but we we often use it to experiment with different what we call tracks of writing. And so, yes, th this this July we have the memoir track, and that's mm -hmm. in part in part because our former program director Lindsay Graham wrote a book. Um, in, in coordination with us called ready set memoir and it's a great you know memoir workbook and so writing a memoir is very similar to writing a novel so we'd like to open up uh, opportunities to different types of writing in different genres uh, for our writers and we'll keep doing that and we'll keep um, having different events whether they're small week-long events or month-long events or year-round challenges to help people keep writing because i think being creative throughout the year is really important yeah, yeah, I agree. It, it's NaNoWriMo completely changed my life, and you know how, now I'm. How did it? How, how did it completely change your life, Stuart? Well, I'm, as you say, I think the first the first year I, you know, I obviously drafted a, drafted a novel. Um, if I'm really honest, I had a breakdown in 2003. Um, I used to be an actor. I used to work a lot in the theatre, and you know something happened which I won't go into. I had a breakdown in 2003. And I could not get up back up on stage. Mm. And um, about six years later, the need to be creative was so um, overwhelming. And I, I don't even remember how I found out about NaNoWriMo. So um, anyway, I, I, you know, wrote my first draft and I'd never written a book before. Um, then we started the writing group and then we started making promises to each other about what we were going to do. And I said, I'm, I am going to, um, edit, edit my, you know, the, the book I drafted. So I spent seven months editing, which now looking back is not very long at all. Um, I self published, um, through a chance conversation with somebody in a bookstore. Um, I was long listed for Polari first book prize. Um, it was one of 10 books long listed and I mean, I, my book just sold and sold and sold. And I sold about 11,000 copies of that book. Um, wow. and I earned enough money to, um, go part-time in my day job. Um, but as you say, I mean, that money, eventually that book's going to go, it's going to stop selling. Um, so that money petered out and I went back to, um, full-time job, thankfully with the same company. Uh, but then, you know, as of last March, just as lockdown kicked off, I converted to full-time writing and obviously now book coaching. So I'm now able to, in occasion, I'll go through another NaNoWriMo writer's manuscript and, you know, give them guidance. And then I thought, well, actually <clears throat> I could do this and get paid. So, you know, my writing has led to book coaching. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm a kind of a bit of a, a bit of an evangelist now you know i've got about 400 active writers um in my region for nanowimo and as i say it has completely changed the way i think about myself um and the way my life operates so thank you <laughs> <laughs> well that's a tremendous story um uh, that's such a great story Stuart. thanks for sharing it i, I don't want to i want to tell listeners that selling eleven thousand books is no that's a, that's quite an achievement just so people know yeah yeah it's um yeah as i say it made a, a massive impact on my life and as you say just owning the phrase i am a writer yeah it's just a paradigm shift in 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 just the way you look at everything really um, it's true there are too many people who don't fully embrace that phrase they doubt mm -hmm. it they don't they or they say it partially or they say it with too much humility or too many excuses. Um, yeah. Or even or just, embarrassment. 
or embarrassment. Yeah. And so I think like, I always tell people just say it and, and say it strongly and confidently and boldly yeah. because you will then receive that very power, um, into yourself, you know, and the more that you say it embarrassingly, as you put it, the more you yourself are going to be embarrassed when you sit down to write. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, I quite agree. So on that note, boss, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on the coming on the show. I really appreciate, you know, you, you taking time out. I know you're a busy man, both with, you know, your own writing and um NaNoWriMo. If you want to learn more about NaNoWriMo, you can go to nanowrimo.org. I will put a link in the show notes, or you can go to grantfalconer.com to find out about Grant's work. Um, and all the comfort sync can provide is available for pre-order now. It's out in July. Um, then, yeah, go and stalk Grant and find out when his uh, September book. Uh, yeah, go, go and support him because he's doing incredible work uh, for writers around the world. Grant, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. This was such a pleasure. I loved talking with you. I loved hearing your stories, and uh, yeah, and thank you. I, I I don't even I don't want to think of myself as your boss. I want to think of myself as uh, <laughs> just I don't know an agent of gratitude because you guys you do so much for writers by by helping those four hundred people every year to write their stories. It's powerful. Yeah, it's a, it's it's an absolute pleasure to see people learn and grow. Thank Absolutely. you again, Grant. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, take care. Bye. You- you too.